Hello. Um, I'll myself up here a bit. So um, I want to read just a bit to you. A kind in glass and a cousin, a spectacle and nothing strange, a single hurt color and an arrangement in a system to pointing. All this and not ordinary, not unordered in not resembling. The difference is spreading. The difference is spreading. That, of course, is the opening to Gertrude Stein's famous Tender Buttons, a poem, she called it, published in 1914. Um, and uh, it's been sort of, uh, you know, c catching the, the gaze and the wonderment of the reading public uh, ever, ever since. Um, but the reason I, I wanted to open with um, a little bit from Tender Buttons, and I'm going to go back to it here in just a second, is um, as I was reading uh, this week's selections from um, BAX 2020, the best American experimental writing, um, I, I was kind of having deja vu a little bit of, uh, of Gertrude Stein and specifically Tender Buttons. And uh, just uh, for clarity's sake, uh, in this last uh, batch of readings, we looked at, uh, and again, uh, some of the names I may mispronounce, so apologies ahead of time, but uh, Kanika uh, Agrawal's um, excerpt from Okazaki Fragments. We also looked at uh, Nasser Hussein's excerpt from Sky Writings. We read the excerpt of Jeffrey Pethabridge's Force Drift, we looked at uh, Kit uh, Schluter's Walking Along the Avenue of the Suicides, the Cockroach. Uh, I also read While the Two Slugs Take Turns Drinking Shots of Vodka. I'm sure some of you did as well. Uh, we also looked at uh, Eric Schmaltz's Path Dependency, uh, Joseph Spies's Odette, and finally we read uh, Vanessa and Helica's via real uh, excerpt assimilation rooms and um, it was particularly the odette piece by by uh, Spies, that rhymes that um that caught my attention in particular when it came to um when it came to um gertrude stein in fact uh, at the at the uh, top of the page um as I, when I started reading, I wrote like Gertrude Stein. And so I've kind of gone back and, and uh, looked at um, some of Stein's stuff. Um, and, um, and I think that if we, if we, if we consider these pieces and, and maybe experimental pieces in general uh, through a similar lens as we might look at Stein's writing and in particular uh, her poem, Tender Buttons, um, it, it might give us a little bit of uh, insight um, into how to deal with these texts. Because I think um, you know, one of the, the troubles that we run into when we come to works like these that are um, constructed in, in ways different than what we normally expect to find in prose writing, um, we, you know, our brain is sort of calibrated to look for the sorts of things that we tend to look for in a typical short story or novel excerpt. You know, we look for uh, the, the plot. We look for, you know, fairly familiar characters and, and uh, those kinds of things. And generally speaking, we don't get that in a lot of these pieces. And so um, we, we don't quite know what to do with it. I think um, perhaps the way we approach poetry is a more fruitful approach for a lot of these experimental pieces. And again, um, Gertrude Stein called her uh, work, Tender Buttons, a poem. Although, as you can see on the page, it uh, certainly looks like prose in many ways. It's uh, divided into three sections. Um, each section is further subdivided into uh, these little... Uh, stanzas, paragraphs, 
um, which are themselves subtitled, and um, and they're they're uh, they're tricky, and so I want to look at this a little bit further, but then I also want to draw from the master William Gass, who wrote a an analysis of Stein's work in particular, looking at tender buttons, which I think is the most insightful analysis of Stein's work that was ever done in the 20th century. And so I want to draw from that a little bit. But um, uh, in general, though, what um, Gass talks about is the fact that, um, you know, Stein uh, was attempting to use a language in a way that was unfamiliar uh, to the to you know the typical reader um, and to get at um, the core or the essence of certain objects and ideas um, as opposed to just sort of skating over the, the surface. And uh, specifically, um, tender buttons is divided into three sections, as I say, objects, food, and rooms. And um, then each of those three um, sections is further divided uh, into um, more discrete units, each of which has a, um, you know, its own title. That bit I just read, a kind in glass and a cousin, etc. That is from a poem entitled "A Carafe That Is a Blind Glass." Um, let me uh, read to you a couple of my favorite sections, uh, excerpts uh, from Tender Buttons. And this is a, uh, a brief uh, poem uh, titled Eyeglasses. And Stein writes, A color in shaving, a saloon is well placed in the center of an alley. And I do like the, the word play, the, the language play, uh, shaving, saloon, center, we have some interesting alliterative phrases there. But what I like in particular about this line is the sort of misdirection. Um, and what I mean by that is, and, and Stein does this a lot, uh, really in a lot of her writing, but particularly in Tender Buttons, where she gets us, you know, on a, on a track and, we, and we're starting to think about, you know, something. And then just mid-sentence or mid-expression or whatever, she switches gears on us and sort of slaps us in the face and, uh, and makes us think about something else. And um, so here again, let me, let me read it again. That's very, very brief. Again, this is titled Eyeglasses. And uh, she writes, A color in shaving, a saloon is well placed in the center of an alley. So, you know, she gets us thinking about eyeglasses and color, but then suddenly throws at us this idea of a saloon, which, which I think is just another uh, iteration of the word salon is the way she's using it here. Well placed in the center of an alley. So, you know, we go from the intimate object of eyeglasses. I mean, anyone who wears glasses, they're almost like a part of you, um, to the sort of decentering of that idea by having us focus on a saloon or a salon uh, that is in the center of an alley. Um, so again, this sort of misdirection, which makes us start to think about um, maybe why did she do that? Why, why did we start off with eyeglasses and suddenly we're, we're looking at um, a, a saloon in the center of an alley? Um, I might suggest that those the beginning image and then where that line ends is not as disconnected as we might think. Um, a, a saloon, a salon, a literary salon that you know Gertrude Stein was famous for in Paris uh, it, uh, in the 1920s when a young expatriate or maybe not so young expatriate uh, writers and painters and poets and the like would come to Paris. Uh, they would uh, immediately be drawn to um, to Stein's um, apartment, and um, she would have these literary salons with readings and and so forth. 
Um, a lot of it was just her own sort of pontificating about uh, about art and literature. And I don't mean that in a in a demeaning way in any sense. She she had really interesting, resourceful, useful, fruitful things to say about all those kinds of subjects. And 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 the reason people were drawn to her was because they were learning from her. Hemingway, famously, um, Picasso, of course, Sherwood Anderson. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Um, so again, the sort of intimacy and perhaps the surprise of a salon, uh, you know, paired with the intimacy, perhaps the clarity of wearing eyeglasses, um, and, uh, the, the, uh, the surprise uh, of connecting, uh, connecting those two, as we might find the surprise in literature, the surprise in art that makes it really stand out. Um, another of my favorites, and this is a this is actually from a longer a piece from the food section uh, on a roast beef, mm, roast beef, but it's just one of the uh, one of the little paragraph stands of things, and and this I love particularly because of the language. Lovely snipe and tender turn, excellent vapor and slender butter, all the splinter and the trunk. All the poisonous, darkening drunk, all the joy in weak success, all the joyful tenderness, all the section and the tea, all the stouter symmetry. And uh, that, you know, reading aloud, if I didn't show you it on the page, mark with my little red line there, you might very well picture it in your head as, as, a, as a more typical kind of poem with very distinct lines and and maybe um, maybe uh, one you know one stanza are broken into some short stanzas or something because you definitely have rhyming. You have a lot of other poetic devices going on in there as well. Uh, but it's just one paragraph of this longer piece. Um, so, what is the meaning of tender buttons? Um, that is a question that people have been asking themselves. Um, you know, since it was published in 1914. Uh, and again, the question is somewhat moot, I think, um, in that what is, the, what is the meaning of art would be a similarly, you know, phrase kind of question and concept. What is the meaning of the Mona Lisa? Uh, what is the meaning of a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Um, its meaning is to be, is to be a piece of art in the world. And um, well, some of the pieces in, in the Bach's, um, uh, you know, anthology that we looked at do seem to be, do seem to have an agenda and do seem to be wanting to say something fairly particular about their subject matter. Several of the pieces I don't think are nearly as well defined as that. And those tend to be the pieces I, I like best, although not exclusively. Um, and again, I think if we approach them more as uh, poetry, even though they're in the form, generally speaking, of prose and, and have, the, have the sort of um, appearance of narrative of a short story or an excerpt from a longer narrative work of some sort, that if we, we think of them as uh, poetry, it might be an easier approach to sort of unlocking them in a way that we might get more out of them. Um, and I want to go to those in just a couple of minutes here. I'm going to make this video a little shorter than what I have been making uh, because I've got another Zoom meeting in just a few minutes. I, I want to get ready for it, but I didn't want to put this this video off any longer. Um, well, the ideas were still kind of fresh in my in my brain, but um, again, I wanted to draw from uh, William Gass and uh, his uh, essay Gertrude Stein and the Geography of the Sentence, and um, it was originally uh, written for and published in the New York Review of Books, uh, but then collected in the World Within the Word, um, and then also it's included in. Um, the William H. Gass Reader, which came out in 2018, um, and uh, somewhat, well, not somewhat, definitely posthumously, 
the master passed away in 2017. But um, unlike a lot of readers, um, he was uh, involved in selecting the material and even arranging them in, in the order that he wanted and had edited them somewhat. There are bracketed comments by, by Gass uh, here and there throughout the reader where he kind of uh, brings up to date some of the ideas he'd been thinking about and so forth. Um, you know, so uh, even though it was published posthumously because it took, you know, a while then to get it actually into print, um, you know, he had a definite hand. So the fact that he included this in his uh, reader, you know, shows its significance for him. Um, Gass uh, pointed to, uh, to several writers as writers that were very, very influential on him. And uh, in terms of uh, female writers, the, the three female writers that he was especially enamored of were, were Stein, uh, Virginia Woolf, and uh, the French author Colette, um, but Stein in particular. And uh, so in this uh, lengthy essay, it's almost a, a, a you know book in itself. It's a really long essay. Um, he talks about, uh, like I said, Stein in general, uh, but he uses tender buttons in particular to illustrate many of his points. And uh, I, I did a paper um, a, a few years ago, three or four years ago, on um, Stein's influence on gas. And I, I used this uh, this essay quite a bit, but I also read uh, quite a bit of other material on Stein and uh, read Stein herself, of course. And um, and so I, I really do think this is maybe the most insightful thing written about Gertrude Stein, and certainly about tender buttons uh, in the 20th century. Um, so uh, just a few of, of Gass's comments about uh, what Stein is up to in tender buttons. Um, he says that, um, that, that every sentence in tender buttons is a syntactical space a room, he says that in parentheses, in which words, things, people, act, cook, clean, eat, or excrete, in order to produce quite special and very valuable qualities of feeling. So again, um, everything is arranged to evoke feeling more so than to express an idea. Again, I think when we start reading prose, um, especially if it is... Um, or even if it is a narrative kind of prose, a short story or a novel, our brain immediately starts to look for meaning. What is going on here? Uh, what is happening? Why is it happening? Um, and so even if it isn't an essay per se, um, we are asking questions of the text which we expect to be answered uh, in sort of lucid, logical kinds of ways. Tender buttons doesn't operate that way. It's not trying to express ideas um, it is trying to evoke feeling. And again, I think uh, many of the pieces that we were reading in the um, Bax anthology, um, and particularly this last batch, which was uh, much more experimental than some previous selections that I gave you. That was, there's a method to my madness. Um, you know, is more about evoking feeling than expressing specific ideas. Um, so be mindful of that. Um, here's another um, insight that Gass offers. Um, he says, Gertrude Stein regularly requests us to find other words within her words in exactly this way. And I'll clarify what that last part means. But regularly requests us to find other words within her words. So um, she gives us words but on, at face value, they don't seem to have much sense within the context that she's giving them to us. But if we start to look at them sort of etymologically or break them up into pieces, the pieces oftentimes have more to do with what the context seems to be. And the, and, and the example that Gas goes into a great deal of, of uh, analysis regarding is, um, is a, a piece of tender buttons um, on nickel uh, that begins nickel. What is nickel? It is originally rid of a cover, etc. And um, and like I said, he goes into a lengthy analysis, which is you know brilliant, of course. But uh, he begins by saying um, 
But had the question been nickels, what are nickels, we might have replied, small change. However, if we listen intently, we shall hear inside the word two others of woeful association. Nick, the name of the devil himself, and hell, his hot location. Our license for following this procedure is first that Gertrude Stein regularly requests us to find words, find other words within her words in exactly this way. And so it's a it's a coded kind of, of writing oftentimes. And certainly um, some of the pieces we read, particularly the, uh, the piece using uh, flight abbreviations, flight code abbreviations to construct words, um, that's almost literally a coded, um, you know, piece of writing. And, and so that's also something that can be very useful. Um, and then finally, maybe, well, almost finally, um, here's another uh, important idea that I think we can see reflected in these pieces. Gas says of Stein and particularly tender buttons, Keywords are obsessively repeated, not only in particular paragraphs, but throughout. Sometimes the sentences look over their shoulders at where they have been, and we are not always prepared for the shifts. So the repetition of particular words and images, but also this idea of the fact that uh, uh, sometimes the sentences look over their shoulders at where they've been, and we are not always prepared for the shift. I think that um, sentence I read about eyeglasses is a great example of that. We start off with eyeglasses. We end up in a, in a saloon, well-centered in the alley. Um, I want to read a few passages from Bax uh, to maybe try to illustrate some of the correlation between, I think, reading Stein and reading some of these pieces. But... Uh, I just want to read this one last passage, just a little bit longer from Gas. And it's not specifically, I think, about, about tender buttons. Um, I mean, it is. But it also can be uh, applied to any sort of challenging work. As I've mentioned a few times, one of the texts that I'm working on is uh, Joyce's uh, Finnegan's Wake. And, um, and it certainly applies to that. But uh, he writes... Without the myths of Eve and Pandora, I should have no sounding board, no principle of selection, nothing to paste my conjectures to, however remarkably I imagined them. So far, what have I been made to do? I have been required to put roots and shoots and little stems and tendrils together, much as their author did, to wander discouraged and confused as Hansel and Gretel through a dark wood of witches to strike the hot right way suddenly, but just as suddenly to mire, to drag, to speed, to shout Eureka, to fall asleep, to submit to revelations, certainly to curl a lip, to doubt, unnose a disdainful snort, snick a superior snicker, curse, and then at some point, not very pleasantly, to realize that the game I'm playing is the game of creation itself, because Tender Buttons is above all a book of kits like those from which harpsichords or paper planes or model bottle boats are fashioned with intricacy, no objection, patience, a demand, unreadable plans, a pleasure. So I'm pulling a poem out of this box. The words on the page do not contain it, but their conundrum does. And again, I, I think this is any challenging text we have to live with it. We have to wrestle with it. And it's through the wrestling. It's through the thinking through, the doing some research, you know, you just sort of letting it percolate in our subconscious, uh, whatever we need to do. It, it's that that then ultimately constructs meaning for us. Um, and it's not literally found in the words on the page. Uh, a simple text does that. Uh, but a complex text does not. It derives its meaning and its pleasure from our having to work to find what's happening in the text. Um, and so, again, even though Gass was writing about tender buttons, he could have been writing about any sort of challenging text. And, um, and again, I think the pleasure of it is in the, the 
piecing together the, the, the decoding of the text and so forth. And um, again, I could point to numerous passages, but um, I just want to look at a couple the, that I think really uh, help to kind of illustrate this point, or, or maybe a different way of saying that is, or a couple that I really, really enjoyed uh, from these selections, or I like, I like them all for one reason or another. But this is uh, the opening from uh, Jeffrey uh, Pethabridge's uh, excerpt, Fort Drift. And as we know, um, a lot of the words in this selection are kind of X'd out, typed over, I guess I should say. Um, but there's a lot of repetition and so forth. But here is the opening of this of this excerpt, at least. Um, we have the, the tail end of a couple of sentences, um, which begin through the carcinogens, the end of a, of a passage, I guess. But then we get, of the corpse poem, pink teeth in its dread mouth, Black, red, bronze, gold, black, dark, red, brown, gleaming, red, yellow, chrome, firelit, bronze. Of the underlying mechanisms of how I am in the epic, I am, I did not want my pain to be transmitted. Dirt abomination, the bitten symptom, park grayed by paper ash and carcinogenic dust, pink teeth, a sign in the mouth, me and the wasps, paper makers. The other dead won't touch the stuff. Slow boiling pith to pulp. I am, I did not want to be asphyxiated. Dry submarine, dirt submarine, swarming with the casualties of or through metastasis. And the underlying phenomenon is still awaited. An emergent kind, albeit lesser, this new lividity, undead, I am, I did not want to be detained. And then we have another break with the X'd out words and so forth. That's all one sentence and we aren't, we aren't done yet. Um, it keeps going on and on like that. Um, beautiful language, but if we're, we're desperately trying to make perfect sense of it, we're gonna be struggling. I think it's more about imagery. It's more about tone. Um, and it's less about making a very concrete, uh, descriptive sort of, of, of sentence, right? Um, now, after, as we read on and we encounter similar sorts of images and ideas and so forth, I, I, a narrative does begin to take shape uh, for us. Um, but again, the language itself is, is almost um, acting as a sort of impediment to understanding as opposed to a, a clear path toward it. Um, but it's a beautiful kind of impediment, um, a beautiful kind of obstruction. It's like a, uh, a winding a trail in the woods that has fallen logs over it and stones in the path and maybe a little you know, creek running through it that we have to step through. Those are all impediments, but at the same time, they, they add to the beauty of the walk. Sure, walking a, a asphalt track, you know, is easy, but is it, is it as enjoyable, as rewarding, as sort of spiritually enriching as that difficult track through the woods with the stones and the streams and the fallen branches and so forth? I think uh, difficult riding can be like that. Um, the other... The other example I wanted to share um, is uh, from Joseph Spieth's Odette. And this is the one where I wrote, gosh, I always get, the, always get my mirror imaging backwards, um, like Gertrude Stein. Um, that was just the first thing that popped into my head as I started to, uh, to read it. And uh, uh, this is a little more um, syntactically... Um, traditional, I guess, than, than the, the piece I just read. But but still, uh, there are very uh, tender buttons-esque elements to it. But uh, Odette begins, Not for nine years has Odette known a hairbrush and her rectangle dress where, dress where the veins grow red-white against a flat pink church floor with taupe-crossing narthex Odette. Eight fingers there since she needs them. 
uh, Hierophant Adet, who one August met Kilth all across her ramified thinking, she recalls 30 cows in a paddock stinking for lack of space and the spoiling color that's roan, hay, offal, drops of milk, big eyes, buckets. Beside the hills, cows locked in a paddock with the wrecks of cars, Odette checked the catch, locked. Odette tore the catch and passed through the gate because of feeling, capital F, feeling. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I think we can already obviously, you know, hear, see if we're reading the sort of bizarre syntax. Again, very Gertrude Stein-esque, um, using words in unusual ways, um, using, um, uh, you know, beautiful language. I mean, there's some really great poetic stuff going on there. Uh, but um, it adds more to our feeling about the text, at this point at least, more so than our sort of clear comprehension of what's going on in the text. Um, so I'll just kind of stop there. Um, again, I could go on with other examples, but, but again, I think if we look to writers like Gertrude Stein, if we look to analysis like Gass's analysis of, of Stein, um, it gives us a sort of path forward with some of these more challenging kinds of texts. And as writers, we also can draw from, from these examples ways that we can experiment with our own prose. Um, and, uh, you know, which I think is very, uh, you know, outside the box, so to speak. But yet nothing is new either, right? We're, we're, we're doing a lot of the same things previous authors have done. And that's fine. You know, that's kind of the fun of it. All right. So uh, my other Zoom meeting is about to start. So I'm going to stop there. I um, hope this had some meaning for you. Uh, if you would uh, make some uh, comments, pose some questions in the announcement thread, and I will see you on down the line.